It's good to be here this morning. It's good to see you all here this morning on the balcony and if you're online. I don't know about you, but this, the worship was awesome, wasn't it? Yeah, should we give it up for the worship team? I think they're amazing. And not to forget our PA team that brings it all together. We tend to forget them. So we're in a series on patterns, and uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Faith started us off about patterns, and I don't know about you, but I was amazed that really every aspect of our life has a pattern. Uh, and Pastor Jonathan continued last week with a powerful sermon about breaking a pattern. And uh, this morning, I will continue on the series of, of, of patterns in our lives, um, and if you feel, oh, you've missed out, you've not missed out, you can catch up all of our sermons on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. So let's just pray before we start. Dear Jesus, Holy Spirit, we know that you are here amongst us. I just uh, commit this part of the service to you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will minister to each one of us individually. You will meet us at our point of need. You will meet us at our point of growth in you, wherever we are on our journey of faith, that you will meet us at that point. Holy Spirit, I ask that you will speak through me your word for your people. I step aside and allow you to speak through me. Speak to us, your people, today in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. So this morning, I'm going to start off with the concept of the backbone. For example, the backbone of an organization. Uh, could be the leadership of the organization, it could be the management of the organization. Now, I work for the NHS, and I believe that apart from our leadership and the directors, the backbone of our NHS is actually our human resources department. Why? Because it's actually the human resources department that actually connects the whole organization together with all of their policies and strategies. Just this week, one of my colleagues asked me, Tracy, I'm trying to apply for a mortgage, what do I do? I need to get my contract. And I'm like, I don't know, but speak to the HR department because they are the ones that actually connect the organization. If you think of your family, somebody in your family unit actually connects your family. They are the backbone of your family. Growing up, I know for myself, my mom was the backbone of our family because she was the one that connected us all together. She was the one that brought us all together. It was a cooking that brought us all together, but we'll say she was the backbone of our family. And I don't know for you who's the backbone of your family. Now, most of you know that I work as a physiotherapist, and um, for me, it is now revealed that literally in the spine, which is what we, uh, in the body, which is what I uh, studied, and that's my expertise, it's all about bones and muscles. Typically, in our bodies, this is your back, well, it's not your backbone. This is the model of, a, you'd be dead if this was your backbone, right? Uh, this is a model of the backbone of the body. Now, the backbone of the body actually connects every part of the body. If you can imagine this, the backbone connects to the skull, to your head. The backbone connects to the pelvis, to your lower limbs. The backbone will connect to your upper limbs, your shoulders. So actually, it's the backbone that's connecting every part of the body. And I want you to keep that concept of the backbone in your mind this morning. Now, as a church, we have five purposes. Now, as followers of Jesus, when you've come to know Jesus, for those of you that know Jesus, that follow Jesus, you will know that nothing in our lives is forced. You are not coerced to follow Jesus. It's a choice. Now, as a church, we have five purposes, and that is usually represented on our hands. So you can be looking at your hands even as we go through these five purposes today. And uh, the little finger represents, and most of you will know this anyway, but the little finger represents maturity about our growing in Christ. The middle finger 
uh, uh, sorry, the ring finger represents our covenant. It represents our membership in the church, our fellowship in the church. The middle finger, which stands above the rest, is your ministry finger. You each have a ministry according to God's will and his purposes. And then you have the pointy finger, which is the one that is mission, which is going out and reaching the lost. And then we have the thumb. And the thumb is actually our life of magnify. It's our life of worship. It is our life of prayer. It is our life of devotion. Now, very appropriately as a church, these are our five purposes, but we have called the thumb, the life, you know, the worship and the magnify, because you see, the thumb as a physiotherapist working with patients that come to me with hand injuries. Now, yesterday we were at a, at a walk and Pastor Jonathan showed me his hand. He had a bit of an injury and I thought, praise the Lord, his thumb's not affected because if your thumb is affected, it affects the whole function of your hand. You're unable to grip, you're unable to do any fine movements because the thumb is the most crucial part of your hand. Now, you can see that if you, the thumb can touch every other finger. You try it. Your thumb can touch every other finger. If your other fingers can touch every other finger, you have a superpower. See me at the end of the service. It's impossible for your little finger to go and touch every, however your thumb can touch every other finger. And similarly, as we look at the purposes of, for us as a church, if we have our devotion life, if we have our life of magnify, our life of prayer light, it starts to affect every other part of our lives, of our spiritual walk with God. You will find that if your devotion, if your prayer life, if your magnify, if your worship is affected, actually it starts to affect you're growing in Christ. It starts to affect your fellowshipping with the believers. It starts to affect your ministry in Christ, and it starts to affect you wanting to reach out. So really, the most important, crucial part of our spiritual walk with Christ is our prayer lives. It's our devotion. It's our worship. It is our magnify. And this morning, I'm going to be talking about one of the most important patterns in our life, which is the pattern of prayer. And this morning, I want you to keep the, keep the whole analogy of backbone because I believe that our prayer lives, our devotions to God, our magnify is actually the backbone of our spiritual walk with God. Everything emanates from there. Even as we, we looked at the purposes as a church, everything emanates from there. So what is prayer? Simply put, prayer is talking to God. You know, the Bible talks about Jesus is our friend. It's like you're going and you're talking to a friend. That is prayer. Very simply put, it's communicating with God. Now, in any relationship, like I've mentioned before, when you come to Jesus, it's a relationship. Nobody's forced you to follow Jesus. And I pray for those of you that do not know Jesus this morning, at the end of this morning, you will say, I want to follow Jesus because that's the greatest decision you will ever make in your life. However, when you look at the whole aspect about prayer, it's all about communication. It's all about uh, relationship. Now, we grow into relationships, don't we? When we get married and, or when you have a relationship with somebody or when you have friends with somebody, you grow into the relationship with them. It's all about communication. Now, the worst thing in a marriage is the silent treatment. Anybody done that? Nobody. Wow. Yes, thank you. One, two honest people in this room. You know the silent treatment when they're in the kitchen and you go and you act like they're not there and you cleaning around them and you giving them the invisible and the silent treatment or you go into the lounge and you busy hoovering and you hoovering around their legs so you're giving them the invisible or the silent treatment for those of you married less than a year you're thinking what is Tracy talking about it's to come if you've not done it yet okay so so what I'm saying is the worst thing about a relationship is, mis is no communication. It's miscommunication. It's, 
So that's why when we come to Jesus, the most important thing is our relationship with him. And your relationship with him is communicating with him. It is talking to him. You know, they say, like I said, so marriage so important is, is communication. Now, we'd, we've done a marriage course. You'd be happy to know I don't lead it because I still do silent treatment and things. But it's run actually by Scylla and Nikki Lee. And we've run this marriage course a few times in our church. And if you're thinking, oh, that's something I would like to maybe look at uh, taking, uh, you know, being part of. I think it's about an eight-week you can fill in your communication card and say, ooh, it, you know, for any married couples going on this cause, it, it's a powerful cause. And so communication is key. Now, in a family, there's a cliche, but I, I, I live by, I, I know, I stand by this. It says, the family that prays together stays together. Have you heard that? Yeah? A family that prays together stays together. Now, growing up, that was very apparent for my life. My parents led very busy lives, but there was no compromise on praying together as a family. Now, we used to call it our family altar. It sounds like a very <laughs> religious word, but it was actually just bringing the family together to pray. And you might be thinking, oh, Tracy, it's all well and good for you. Your parents started that. But my parents had to establish that in our home in order for us to establish that in our home. And I pray that one day Rachel would establish that in her home, and then it continues in generations to come. The point is, parents, the point is everybody, things were... Things and patterns that we establish in our lives now not, is not just for the now, it moves on to generations to come. So I would encourage you parents, establish this family altar in your home. If you've not done it before and if you think, oh, this is like an unfamiliar domain there, it's a beautiful thing. Because that becomes the backbone of your family. That becomes where your family is actually staying together because they are praying together. And the other thing, parents, is to be aware. You know, psychologists say that children establish their ways by the time they're three to five year old. So start as soon as you can by getting your family together. They say by three to five, they're already set in their ways. They know what they want. They know, and you can see that. You know, I teach the kids. You can see by that age, they're already set in the ways. That's why Proverbs teaches us. Proverbs 22 verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way they, he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. There's a reason why that is. So we train up our child because patterns in our lives need to be established now so it moves on to generations to come. So this morning, the question is about patterns of prayer is that do you have a pattern of prayer? And you might be thinking, oh, I've come for the first week. Don't ask me that question. You've come to the right place. I'm going to use the analogy of traffic lights, ready, steady, go, yeah? And we're going to be looking at that. I think I'm thinking ready, steady, go, because Rachel's just started her driving lessons, and she's been driving. She's, she's getting really good at it. And can I just warn you? I have to stop you. You know about patterns, right? <laughs> You know, um, Dave is the, the gentleman that takes her out for her driving lessons, and uh, Dave is the guru now. Never mind, we've been driving for 30, over 30 years, uh, uh, Dad and I. Whatever Dave says is like the truth, and it's the honor, and you know, nothing can shift that. And the other thing is parents, after they start their driving lessons, when you get into the car with them, each time becomes like a driving test for you. Mommy, you did not do this. Because the other thing is we get into patterns. You know, and when I, uh, I you know, before we, Rachel even started with Dave, we took her to, um, I just took her to this open place and I told you, Rachel, just drive. And then she came back after Dave had given her the first lesson and said, Mommy, you have taught me nothing. You never even told me to adjust the seat. You never told me to do the mirrors. You know? And that's patterns as well, isn't it? We can get into patterns where we just get into the car and drive. Anyway, back to prayer. Sorry about that. So prayer, um, ready. Some of you here might be sitting 
and you are in a crossroad in your life and you might be here and you've come for the first time and you might not even be a follower of Jesus, but you're seeking after something. You know, the Lord loves it when we desire after him, when we thirst after him. And you might be at that point where you're saying, you know what, I am ready. I am ready to start praying. I'm ready to start my journey. That's where you are when you come to a traffic light and you're ready. You're actually ready to start. You're starting to, you know, you're ready to start the journey. Now, when you look at the Gospels in the Bible of Jesus, now the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where Jesus walked with his disciples everywhere. And for those of you that have been to Israel, you actually saw where Jesus walked. That must be the most amazing thing. I would have loved to have been a disciple of Jesus. Anybody here with me? Would you have loved to be a disciple of Jesus where you actually followed him around and watched him do these miracles and you saw all these signs and wonders and then you, you went with him and you did enough miles, never mind counting your steps, you were like fit as anything, isn't it? Because we were walking and, uh, you know, and you saw all of this happen. And what astounds me in the Bible is that these disciples, these men and women that walked with Jesus all over, what is it that they ask Jesus to teach them to do? Is it to become a great leader? Is it to do all that he's done? No, what they ask Jesus to do is they say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. You know why? Because those disciples knew that the backbone of Jesus' ministry was his prayer life. You know, in the Bible, you look, you look, and Jesus prayed. Guys, if Jesus prayed, what do we need to do? Oh no, I need a better response. If Jesus prayed, what do we need to do? We need to pray. Yes, we do. We do need to pray. And, and they saw that. And in the Bible, we read Jesus got up early. He left. He went to pray. After the miracle feeding of the 5,000, Jesus left. And the people all went. Jesus left. And he went to pray. And that was the backbone of even Jesus' ministry. And today, this morning, that is why I'm, I'm encouraging you to establish this pattern of prayer because it's the most important thing in our lives that we could that we could do and this morning because Jesus prayed that became the backbone and pastor Jonathan spoke about moving from the invisible to the visible and about moving from that private place to the public place this morning everything stems from the private place of being in the presence of God being in his presence, reading his word, having a good life of devotion. That is what will touch every other part of our walk with Christ. Now, the model of prayer is found in Matthew, but also in Luke. And we're going to look at that this morning. And in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 4, it says, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. Just as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say. And it's up on the board. So up on the board, up on the screen. I feel like I'm a teacher. So we're going to pray this together. Our Father in heaven. Are you ready? Are you going to help me pray this to this morning? Yeah? So we're going to start off with the word, our Father. Are you ready? One, two, three. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And it goes on to say, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that is the most powerful prayer we can start praying in our lives, yeah? That is the most powerful. And this morning you might be thinking, and we did this this morning in our prayer meetings, you might be thinking, where do I start? This is a powerful model of prayer. We can meditate on these verses each and every 
day of our lives. And eat through the day, you can even start looking at, at it. You know, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day, each and every day, we can pray this, our daily bread. Yeah, and we can pray this each and every day for our lives. This is a powerful model of prayer to follow. And this morning, if you're here for the first time, or if you're seeking, or even for those of you that have been here many years and you feel like, you know what? I need to go back to this model of prayer because this is the Lord's prayer. This is Jesus teaching us how to pray. It is a powerful starting point for our prayer lives. And this morning, you know, when we start something, it's so important that we sustain what we start, that we keep going with what we start. And as a church, as a leadership, we can't impress the importance of our small groups, yeah? Where would you sustain it? And going back again to small group, for those of you that are leaders, for those of you that are ministry leaders, you will find that those groups, those ministries that actually promote, that actually practice, that actually persevere with prayer, even in their ministry, even in their connect groups, are the ones that thrive, are the ones that are successful. So keep prayer as the backbone of our lives and even in our connect group. And you might be there and you're thinking, this is all overwhelming. Why not start with some worship songs? Why not start with... Um, there's an acronym that I use called ACTS, uh, which we learn on the Alpha course, which is uh, ACTS with A for adoration. Just adore the Lord. If you're thinking, how do I pray? Just come before the Lord. Just adoration. Just adore the Lord. C is confession. Confess your sins. You know, as we, we saw um, when we read the, the, the Lord's Prayer, forgive us of our sins. So confession before him. T is thanksgiving. And S is supplication. So adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, which is asking of the Lord. And that is a great, powerful way to start our prayer lives. So as we move on to the ready, we move next to the, to the steady. And, uh, and that's trying to maintain a good pattern. Now, you might be sitting here and you're going to tell me which is the most used excuse ever. Anybody know what's the most excused use excuse ever? Time. Yes. I've got no time. Now, I sit with my patients, right? And I tell them, you know what? You need to start doing some exercise. I've got no time. And, and I think, and they tell me about their social history, and, and I, I, anyway, I'll carry on, I won't, I won't, because we recommend that they do at least 30 minutes of exercise over five days, which is 150 minutes a week. So just so you know, that's what the NHS asks of each one of us, to do some exercise each week. The question is, you might be saying, Tracy, I don't have an hour. Your, the question to you is, what do you have this morning? What do you have? Do you have 10 minutes in the morning to read your Bible, to pray, to come before the Lord? Do you have 10 minutes at lunchtime? Do you have 10 minutes on an evening? What do you have this morning? Because this is probably the most crucial thing for our lives. It could be the turning point of our spiritual walk with the Lord. It is very, very important. Now, I was on a, a course, it was a lean management course. It wasn't about lean management, but it was looking at the organization, yeah? So I went on this lean management course, and they were starting to look at processes of continuous development. They started to look at small incremental changes in an organization that will bring a long-term effect uh, or a long-term improvement in the organization. So we were all from the NHS, so we looked at our different departments, like how can we improve on patient care, how can we improve? And when we started to look at it, we looked at something called waste management with our time, because so often we can waste our time on things that are not important, and that's what we started to look at as an organization. And towards the end of that sessions with the facilitator, she told us to map out our day. 
And this morning, when you go uh, through the week, if you go into your connect groups, I would love for you to map out your day and look deeper into this. Because all of us have patterns for our day and systems for our day. And you might be thinking, oh, no, I don't. Yes, you do. When you get up in the morning, you would get up, you do get to the bathroom, do what you need to do, you shower, whatever you need to. You might read your Bible, you might pray, or you might grab your cup of tea. You've got a system. Or you might just get up and reach for your phone and look at your social media. All of those things are systems that we have in place for our lives. And Pastor Jonathan spoke last week about some patterns in our life that might not be good. And we pray that as you go through through the series that the Holy Spirit will prompt us to get into good patterns, godly patterns for our lives. And uh, so the facilitator asked us to map out our day. And then we started to realize that as we were maybe traveling to work, we could look at doing some training or, 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 or look at a podcast, you know, listen to a podcast or starting to look at bringing exercise into our world and all of those. So mapping up our day, mapping out our day is very good. You know, I'm going to be straightforward to you because realistically, is it really about time or is it about choice? Is it about time or is it about choice? You see, prayer is a spiritual battle. You see, it is a spiritual discipline. At the end of the day, do you think the enemy wants you to go and sit at the feet of Jesus, read the Bible, and pray? No. John 10.10, 10, which is a scripture I probably use every time I preach, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy but Jesus has come to give us life and life more abundant. But that's what the enemy is trying to do. And this morning, Pastor Jonathan also said that it's like the enemy is ready to pounce on you. He doesn't want you to have a spiritual life of prayer. Let's face it. You know, it's about choice because at the end of the day, you'd rather be binge watching on Netflix than going and reading your Bible. That, you know, you know, it might not be you, you might like to go out and do whatever, but it is a spiritual battle, and that's why this morning, as I bring you this word, I want you to start thinking about establishing this pattern in each of our lives, because going forward, the Lord is wanting to move us to the goal level. He doesn't want us to stay in this ready, steady level. He wants us to start moving into what he's called us for. And it, you know, it is about a thirst and a longing for the Lord. If you consider athletes today, you know, I was speaking to an athlete yesterday, and is it really about time for them or is it about choice? You know, you've, you've got some brilliant rowers, swimmers, cyclists in England, isn't it? Do they go to the, to the track or to, the, to the, wherever they're going to practice, to the, to the river or on the track? Do they go there at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock? Do you think it's uh, because they got... Is it a time issue? No, it's a choice issue. They want to be great at what they do. And as Christians, as followers of Jesus, do we want to be the best that we can be for Jesus? Then we need to establish our pattern of prayer. We need to get that right in our lives, guys. Don't miss this because the Lord is speaking to us. He wants us to move. He wants us to go into what he has called us to. And this morning, it's not about time. I would encourage you to go map out your day because it's never, never about time. You see, we make time for things that are important to us. We all do that. That's human nature. Now, the other thing about being in the steady place is when you become a Christian for a long time, the problem with being too steady is that you can move into a stagnancy. Now, I want you to think, consider stagnant water. You know, you've got free-flowing water, and then you've got water that becomes stagnant, where it becomes mucky, murky. And in that stagnant water, there is no growth. In that stagnant water, there is no freshness. There's no newness. And the Lord is wanting to tell us, for those of us that have been on the journey a long time, don't allow your steadiness to lead to your life of prayer becoming a stagnant one. 
Because each day should be a day of freshness in the Lord. Each day should be a new day in the Lord. You know, the Lord says each day is a new, how a blessed day in him. Jeremiah 31 verse 25 says, I will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. Psalm 119 says, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. And this morning, uh, a, a while, a long time ago, when I was very little, we used to sing a song. And for those of you that are young, and you don't say anything about the song, this is one of my favorite songs, okay? Uh, but it says, I keep falling in love with him. Anybody know the song? Over and over and Oh, thank goodness some of you know it. Over and over again, and he gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between the, my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over over and over again. You will know I have not made up those lyrics. They are sung by heritage singers, and that is how our life should be in the Lord. Each day should be a day where we are falling in love with him, over and over, over. It's a newness, it's a freshness, and that is what God brings in our lives when we come to him, when we live that life of devotion to him, when we come to him and we magnify him and we get our prayer lives right before him, that's what he brings. He brings a freshness. He brings a new revelation. If you're saying the same things over and over, there's no freshness in what you're saying. The Lord is wanting to bring something new each and every day. I want you to think to start stepping into that. And that is when we move into the goal. This is when we, you move that car, where you move the journey, where you're on the journey, where you do, you're thriving in your prayer life. And for the athlete, it is you've taken off and you're moving forward. Now, when I started to think of this whole aspect of go, I started to think of the word kairos. I don't know whether you've heard this word before, K-A-I-R-O-S. If you're taking notes, put that down, look at it, K-A-I-R-O-S. R-O-S, Kairos. Now, the Kairos moment is like an opportune moment. It's the right moment when you move into what God has called you to. And this morning, I sense very strongly that many, many, many of you sitting here, you are in your Kairos moment. The Lord is wanting to say to you those prophetic words that were spoken over your lives, that passion that is in you that is welling up, this is your moment to move forward in it. Because God has called each one of us for a purpose. He's called each one of us, he's got a destiny for us. And you might be thinking, oh no, no, it's not for me. It is. If you consider uh, people in the Bible, say for example Moses. Moses was a servant of God. They call Moses a servant of God. And Moses had a beautiful relationship with, with God. He spoke to God. He asked God for everything. He told God, if you're not going with me, I'm not going. Moses was a powerful a man of God in the, you know, in the Bible. You, you consider David a man after God's own heart. You know, David had, had a wonderful relationship with God. All those battles that he fought, when you read the, you know, if you read uh, Samuel, the book of Samuel, it's all about David's life. And when you read about those uh, battles that he would go and he would fight with, with the army, he would ask God, you know, in Ziglag, for example, he'd ask God, God, should we go and pursue the enemy? And the Lord will say, yes, David, go and pursue the enemy. And you might be thinking, yeah, they, that's wonderful. Those are stories. No, God is wanting the same relationship with us. He wants to speak into our lives. He wants you to say to him, Lord, I'm not going to that interview if you're not coming with me. Lord, I'm not going to work if you're not coming to me. He wants that type of faith in us. He wants that audacious faith in us to step in to the destiny for which he has called us to. Now, another great example of a man of faith and a man of prayer is Daniel in the Bible. Now, that is a beautiful pattern of prayer. Um, of Daniel, and Daniel prayed three times uh, a day, and, and you might be thinking, three times a day, but you know, we were doing um, a, a devotion last year actually, and he talked about prayer pauses through the day. In the morning, have, you know, pause to praise, pause to pray, and I feel that's what Daniel had for his life. 
He, he prayed three times um, a day. Let's just read Daniel 6, verse 10. It says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and he prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Nothing phased Daniel in his prayer life. Now this decree, if you read the book of Daniel, you can go and read the book of Daniel. It's a powerful book. This decree, this command was given by the king that you are not to bow down to any other god. You will bow down to this graven idol that was created. And Daniel, that did not faze him, even death did not faze him. He chose to go down, go on his knees and pray to his God. Why did he do that? Why did he actually think that I don't care about death, I care more about doing what God is wanting me to do? Because Daniel knew that his, his life, Whatever God has given him was an overflow of his prayer life. He knew that God will take care of him. He knew that God will see him through. And God, you know, Daniel was given the gift of interpreting dreams and understanding visions. And Daniel lived in his Kairos moment. He lived in that Kairos time with the Lord. Why? How did he do it? Because he was not operating on his own with his gifts. He had the power of God that was working in him. Now, you might be sitting there and you might be thinking, oh, Tracy, you're talking about superstars in the Bible. You're talking about Moses and David and Daniel. And can I just tell you, these men are just like you and I. These men felt inadequate. These men felt insecure. These men lacked confidence. These men were sinful. They are just like you and I. And I prompt you today. I encourage you today. I, uh, you know, I earnestly speak to you this morning that the Lord is calling us to live in this Kairos moment, this opportunity that he's giving us, and I pray that you will not lose it because I really sense that prophetic words have been spoken over many of you today, and you're just sitting there, and you're thinking, what do I do next? Well, what you do next is you start waiting on the Lord. You start looking to him. You start seeking him because the, Jeremiah says when, I, you, when you seek him, you will find him. When you seek him with all your heart. And that is the people that the Lord is calling us to, do, to be. He wants to reveal to us all these powerful things in our lives if we would only come to him. You see, some of us have the wrong notion here. We think we can do it on our own. No. Colossians 1.27 says, To them God willed to be known. What are the riches of the glory of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's got nothing to do with us. It's all about Jesus that is living with us that can accomplish great things. Amen? Are you there? Amen? Yeah. If you look at Ephesians 3 verse 20, and this is our uh, a verse for the week, if you can go and look at this as well. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power, that is at work within us. It's not about us, but it's about the power that is working within us to do great things that God has called us to do. And this morning, I would encourage you to get into a pattern of prayer, to start sustaining this pattern of prayer, but make sure it's not becoming stagnant. And I just want to leave you with the visual of the backbone because prayer is the backbone of our spiritual walk in Christ. And we looked at the five purposes that how worship and magnify affects every single other aspect of our spiritual walk with the Lord. And you will find that. And if you're starting to think, you know, why is it that I, I'm struggling in my ministry? Or why is it that I'm struggling to reach out? Or why is it that I'm struggling to actually grow in Christ? Start to look at your pattern of prayer. Start to look at your prayer life, your devotion. And this morning, I, I would love to pray with you. Um, and uh, some of you here might not even know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and that's, you know, when we talked about the ready part and 
And uh, that is the greatest gift you will ever, ever, ever receive in your life. And it's a free gift. And this morning, I don't want to miss the opportunity of praying with you. If that's you this morning and you, and you think, you know what, I, um, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. I am ready for him to come and be, uh, you know, the Lord of my life, the captain of my life. And, and you know, I just sense some of you might be sitting here and you, you may have actually just moved away from God. And you, it might be just this morning that you feel that you need to recommit your life to Christ. It, it's like you need to say, you know what, Lord, I, I'm, I just need to recommit my life to you. And I just want to pray, but firstly for those that are, that are new and, and want to give their lives to Jesus. And I'm going to pray, and you can echo this prayer. Please, if you've if you got your communication card at this point, it will be great if you could t- take out your communication card. And we talked about the marriage course. And for those of you that think, you know what, I don't even know what my ministry is, we do a ministry course as well. And you might want to put that. That's what you want to get involved in. Uh, for some of you, you might be thinking, you know what, I'm ready. I, might, I want to join a connect group. I want to sustain changes that I will make in my life. Um, for some of you, you might be saying, you know what, I'm, I've just become stagnant in my faith. There's no freshness. There's no newness. And that might be what you want to put there on your card. Or for some of you, you might be thinking, you know what, I'm in my Kairos moment. I, I need to maybe get around a mentor or a coach that can help me through this, that I could be the best that we could be. So this is your communication to us. So I would encourage for you every single one of you to fill this in and even just tell us that you've been here this morning. So let's just pray firstly for those that are ready to receive Christ in their life. If that's you today, you can just echo this prayer with me. Thank you, Jesus. Lord Jesus, I I realize that I've messed up and my past is full of sin. Um, I confess my sin before you, Lord, and I come before you this morning. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you have died on the cross for my sins. And this morning, I accept you as the Lord and Savior of my life. I ask for you to come and be that Lord and Savior that will guide me through my life. I commit my life to you anew. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I would just love to pray for those that feel that they are stagnant in their faith, that that feel like, They actually, you know, that mucky water analogy of you actually stuck in there. There's no growth. There's no life. This morning, I just want to pray over you. And even as I pray also for those that are in their Kairos moment that are moving forward into what God has for them. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray for those especially that are feeling that they are stuck in, in in a feeling of being stagnant in their spiritual walk with you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that there will be a freshness uh, that comes over them, Lord. There'll be a freshness uh, that comes over us, even as a church, Lord, that you will uh, bring a new revelation amongst us. There'll be a freshness that comes from you. There'll be a fanning into flames as well, Lord, of things that are in our lives, Lord, that will not be stagnant in our faith, Lord, but we will be excited to serve you. We'll be excited to live in your purpose. And Lord, I pray especially this morning for those that are in their Kairos moment, for those that are moving forward into what you've called them to do. I pray, Lord, that there'll be an audacious faith in them, that they will step into what you've called them to do. Even this morning will be that stepping stone into what you've called them to do. Lord, I pray that they'll be wise, there'll be wisdom in the house. There'll be wisdom even as they step into that. Lord, I pray that even in our connect groups that they can come around people. I pray for prayer partners. I pray for all of these things to be established so as a church, we can all step in to what you have called us to, Lord. We pray for Destiny Church, Lord, even as we move as the church into our kairos in you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we will move as a mighty a team, as a, as a mighty army ready to do what you have called us to do, even as each of us step into our kairos in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus.